Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to you, Matt Zaglin, Kelly Cook, Scott Hepburn, and brand new patron, Ernesto. Everybody, welcome, Ernesto. Welcome, Ernesto. On this episode of DTNS, Andrew Main explains why thinking about AI in movies and TV shows may be thinking too small. Plus, Canva is taking on Adobe and why chatbots may not replace search engines. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, March 26th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood Adjacent, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, founder of Interdimensional, former open AI science communicator and author of Dark Dive, a thriller, Andrew Bain. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me back. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for being here. Uh, we're going to have a really good conversation uh, about what's going on with OpenAI and the video generation and some ideas that you probably haven't heard a lot of other folks talk about. So stick around for that. Also notable, Apple announced WWDC and thus its AI strategy update will kick off Monday, June 10th. And now the rest of the quick hits. Later this year, Sony will add a community game help feature that lets PS5 players upload gameplay to help developers make hint videos. If you opt in, the feature will automatically capture game clips when you complete certain activities. Moderators will review those and then publish them as a game help hint for other PlayStation players to watch. The published version will not have audio from your mic or webcam. You can remove the clips if you want. Community game help will also come to select games later this year. Microsoft's uh, do a little shuffle at the top. Uh, if you recall, they recently created a new AI division and put Mustafa Suleiman in charge of it. Suleiman just left Inflection AI, along with a lot of the staff, to come to Microsoft. And Suleiman also is famous for being one of the co-founders of DeepMind, now run by Google. Mikhail Perakin has been in charge of Copilot, Bing, and Edge pretty much all of Microsoft's consumer AI efforts for a while now and was going to have to report to Suleiman, but apparently he did not want to. Instead, Parakin has stepped aside from his AI role and will now report to CTO Kevin Scott temporarily while he explores new roles probably outside Microsoft, maybe in a community theater. I have no idea. Uh, it appears Copilot, Bing, and Edge will stay under Suleiman's new AI division as part of the web experiences team. Meanwhile, what you're going to see in all the headlines is the announcement that Pavan Davaluri, previously responsible for the Windows and Surface teams, will now head a combined version of those teams called Experiences and Devices. Google will release a new native version of its Chrome browser for Windows on ARM this week. Users of Windows on ARM machines could use the X64 version of Chrome in an emulated state previously, but it had slower performance. The announcement comes in advance of the launch of Qualcomm's Snapdragon X Elite chip, expected this summer. The chip will feature in multiple power-efficient ARM-based Windows machines. Speaking of ARM, uh, they are joining up with Intel, Google, Qualcomm, Samsung, and a few other companies to found something called the Unified Acceleration Foundation, or UXL, in order to create an open source software suite for AI development. UXL launches with Intel's One API, an open standard that does not tie coding tools to specific architecture, specifically NVIDIA's CUDA platform. That architecture is powerful, but it's also scarce due to demand, and it's only available from NVIDIA. UXL says it will focus at first on open options for apps and will eventually support NVIDIA hardware and code. Uh, of course, NVIDIA is not part of UXL, at least not now. Neither is Microsoft or AMD, and they are rumored to be developing their own alternative to NVIDIA. Instagram and Threads have introduced a setting that lets you opt in to receive more political content, if you so desire. The algorithms on both platforms limit political content recommendations from accounts that you don't follow. In Content Preferences, you'll now find a new setting called Limit Political Content from People You Don't Follow, checked by default. You can uncheck it, of course. You can, you know, get more uh, politics in your feed if you want. Um, Adam Masseri, who runs uh, both of these platforms, said in the past, uh, we want to do this by design, but sounds like they realize people have different wishes, especially in an election year. Meta defines political content as posts about governments, elections, and social topics. All right. 
Let's talk search engines. David Pierce has an article on The Verge called Here's Why AI Search Engines Really Can't Kill Google. Uh, and he took it upon himself to compare traditional search results from the likes of Google and Bing to AI-focused search engines like U.com and Perplexity, as well as Microsoft's Copilot. He broke down the comparison into what are considered by search engine professionals to be the three common types of queries. It's a great article. I think I would recommend everybody read it. We'll have a link in our show notes. Uh, but I thought for today, we could walk through those three types of queries, talk about what David said he found, and then what we think of his findings. Uh, the first one is navigation. This is the idea that you type in the name of the website you want to visit in the search engine, and then you go there. This is why Facebook is often, or Facebook.com even, is often the number one search term, because people do that uh, very literally sometimes. Uh, and not a surprise, Andrew, that AI wasn't as good at that as a search engine, right? Yeah, I mean, when you want to use a directory, use a directory. Yeah, and that's the one thing that I think search is going to continue to be advantageous at because it's simple. That's what search has been defined at. The second one is information. So things like, uh, what time is it? What's the weather? Give me some sports scores. The results varied here. Google and Copilot were both pretty good. So you had a search engine and an AI uh, devoted engine that were both pretty good at this. Google did have the edge, according to David Pierce, by providing you a little more context, things like stat boxes, knowing your location, et cetera. Uh, those made the results more relevant, especially for things like weather. More evergreen information, though, like how many weeks are there in a year, was handled well by all of them. And very precise information was handled by the AI. AI tools the best, uh, things like how do you do a screenshot on a Mac or what's the proper ratio of coffee grounds to water? Uh, Andrew, what, what do you make of these? The, this seems obvious as well, right? Yeah, I think that it's very early days as far as AI and search. And the example he gave, you know, where if you just want to know how to get to Google and Google.com, do you need a big LLM language model to do that? But I think the problem with search is that we've been conditioned through 20 years of Google search to think about search in a very narrow way. I just put a thing in there. My favorite demonstration to show you the limitations of traditional search is if you Google how many emancipated minors are there in the United States, you get a wildly wrong answer. And it's been like that for years. It's one of millions that are wrong because all Google does is says, hey, this is the most popular answer to the question. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but if nobody else has bothered to ask it, so there's no critical thinking that comes into play. And models have their you know, disadvantages with hallucination and stuff, but AI search has gotten progressively better over the last 12 months. And I think a year from now, it's going to be fantastically better. But traditional Google search, I don't know. And, and this answer, by the way, too, if you use Google search, they'll get this answer from the web, then they'll feed it into their LLM and it'll give you the same answer. But no, there are not 20 million emancipated minors in the United States. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that would be a lot of emancipated minors. Right? Yeah. I, you know, I, I think the, inf the information thing is interesting because something like what time is it is, I don't know. I mean, I ask my Amazon assistant that all the time. I don't know if my Apple watch isn't handy. Um, but, you know, for that to kind of trip up the system, but something more evergreen, like how many weeks are in a year, uh, you know, it, it gets it right more, uh, more of the time. It's kind of like, okay, do we, it almost goes back to the conversation about having a wake word. So it's like, let me tell you kind of how I want you to respond. It's this kind of question ahead of time. And that's where it's interesting to me that AI feels like it has a long way to go to get results that, like you said, Andrew, we're so used to getting by doing something very simple, but in a kind of non-human way for the query. Yeah, I mean, that's it's a, it's a good point about knowing what you mean. And that's the problem LLM struggle, because when you ask how many weeks are in a year, do you want just 52 or do you want a precise answer? Because there's not exactly 52 weeks in a year because of the way the Earth moves around the sun, et cetera. <laughs> and models will struggle to be like, okay, well, are we talking about a leap year? Because there's a leap year, then we got another day. But also we're talking about like we add a few seconds every year. So that's where models will sometimes give you these answers that feel like, is that off? Or is it just struggling to understand what I mean? And the more they know about us and how we want to answer, that's you know one of the features that OpenAI put in for ChatGPT is you can give it some background. I like these kinds of answers. I like this and like that. And then over time, all these models are going to be doing that. If you yeah. Will. I feel like the advantages that Pierce found for search are temporary advantages. Uh, things like knowing your location and context. Those are things that that your chatbot could easily have access to if you want them to, right? 
Yeah, a big a big update had been adding the use of tools, which you know ChatGPT will. If you ask it a mathematical question now, it'll just create a Python calculation to answer that instead of using the LLM to do it. Uh-huh. Or you know there are GPTs that will use your location, then ping you know Microsoft Map Services or whatever to give you data on that. And I think we're going to just see way more of that where the model just says, oh, well, let me just use a tool. You know, whether that be Bing, you know, ChatGPT uses Bing all the time to get answers. Yeah. Uh, the final, the third of the three common types of queries and the least common type of query is exploration. Uh, those are questions that don't have a single answer. So Pierce used, uh, why were chainsaws invented as an example? Or what is TikTok? Uh, he found that Perplexity and U.com handled these very well with concise answers and citations for further exploration. It does seem like this is where LLMs shine the most, right? Yeah, and I think that's getting into a lot of the reason we use an LLM. We use it, use search to say, tell me where I can find that information. Mm-hmm. You can use LLMs to say, bring that information to me. And that's very different. And we're still learning to think that way. You know, my wife spends, you know, will spend a long time just going back and forth, having conversations about putting together meal plans and recipes and diets and stuff because it goes back and forth. And traditional search doesn't do that unless somebody wrote that blog post you're looking for. So I think. The more we think about, oh, I can use it this way, the more capable it becomes. Yeah. And it's interesting. I thought of search engines in the 90s as find a website for me, right? I, I need yeah. a website that talks about this. Uh, and search engines are still the best at that. And those are still the most common types of queries. But over the years, the search engines, I think, have tried to pitch themselves as we can answer any question. And that's not a thing search engines yeah. are all that good at on their own. And, and chatbots and LLMs are better at that. Hotspot, give me some Phantom Menace spoilers. <laughs> uh, I remember it was well. Hot Wired. What was it? What was Hot Wired? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hot Wired. There we go. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Online design company Canva has agreed to acquire professional design software company Affinity. This gives Canva an online service with 175 million users and native apps for Windows users, Mac users, and people who like Macs but also have iPads. Prices also are undercutting Adobe's suite of products, at least for now, when you're comparing them side by side. Affinity Photo, Affinity Designer, and Affinity Publisher uh, can be sold in a bundle, but it can also be sold individually. Not a subscription model, though. It's a one-time fee, which obviously makes it pretty different than how Adobe does stuff. Uh, Andrew, I don't know if you use either Canva or Affinity products or both, um, but uh, what, what are your thoughts on on this, uh, this merge? Well, one, uh, I wonder if they time this till after Adobe got denied the ability to acquire Figma. Um, you have to wonder if that would have been looking upon a different light for this. Uh, mm. Canva certainly made a place for itself with a lot of different sort of tools to use. I I find it sometimes I feel like it feels like it's about 15 years out of date. So I certainly think buying, you know, a platform that's, a, you know, that's available in all these different ecosystems is I think a very good idea. And I wonder if they are going to shift to a subscription model. That seems to be like that might be where they want to go to is they want to get you to, you know, continue to justify paying a monthly fee. And I wouldn't surprise me if that's what happens to affinity. Yeah. I mean, so if you, if you do all affinity uh, products uh, together and or not annually, (laughs) see, I'm doing it again. Uh, $115 um, for, for the three each are otherwise sold uh, for $49 a piece uh, Canva does have subscription plans though. So, you know, maybe the company sort of is able to say, we'll do it all depending on what you're looking for. Maybe well, affinity I, I think, one-time prices go away. I think you're right. I think, I think they're going to fold it in. And I remember I was skeptical when Adobe went to the subscription model. I remember back in the day and I, cause I was also like, they're like, Oh, you know, Microsoft wants to do a word. And I like, I'm sorry, I'm never going to pay a subscription for a text editor. But a model like Adobe, I said, as long as Adobe keeps improving it by adding features, which they've done that like year after year, it is a much better product. So I think for, that's what Canva's up against is the idea of like, if, if you want to have that sort of suite, give them a bunch of tools, get people in. And then I don't question every year when I pay my Adobe subscription. I look at Canva and some of these things feel like I had to, my publisher sent something to in Canva and I got so angry. I wrote something that was better <laughs> in like 40 minutes using chat GPT because it was just so frustrating how backwards it was. So I think it's a good move for Canva. 
Yeah, Canva has got a very popular online service uh, and Affinity has very beloved uh, offline versions of competitors to Adobe together. It you know makes sense on paper that they're a credible competitor to Adobe. But like y'all are saying, it's the, the, the proof is in what they do. And it seems too obvious for Canva not to include versions of Affinity Photo Designer and Publisher in a subscription, which is going to turn Affinity fans off. Canva will go bend over backwards to say, we're not going to get rid of the offline versions or the solo versions or the bundled versions and the universal licenses will stay. Uh, but people will be very skeptical of that. And they're going to they're going to face backlash just against the idea of including it in a Canva subscription, which they're I think you're right. They're going to do they're going to have to do. That's just part of what Canva does. I'm with you, Andrew, when Adobe first announced, you know, Creative Cloud, I was like, this is great. I'm going to end up paying so much more over time, which is actually true, but it's a better service for me. I can also bounce out for a couple of months if I'm like, you know, I'm really just not going to need Photoshop right now, but I'm going to, you know, when I pick up a new project on the road type thing. It, it works better for me. The, the whole sort of pay once and be done with it, which... <laughs> Kind of sounds familiar to the conversation, Tom, you were having with Trisha Hershberger on the show yesterday. It's like, same thing with games. It's like, do you yeah. pay once and just play? Or do you maybe pay as you uh, pay as you go for fun new features that might, you know, crop up as you go forward? I don't think there's a right or wrong answer here, but I am interested to see uh, if Canva sort of says like, hey, we're going to we're going to keep everything as it is with affinity because, the, you know, they're going to upset people if they change things right away. Or, you know, do they change things down the road or do they leave as is? Yeah. And I think it's, it's good to see a competitor to Adobe in the in, in place too. Yeah. I, I agree. I think Adobe has got such a war chest to spend on things like AI and everything else like that. And yeah, I think that I think this is probably the most strategic move they can do. Yeah. Uh, folks, if you have ideas of what you would like us to hear about on the show, one way to let us know is our subreddit. Uh, we look at it every day for ideas and, and they are included in the show. Submit your stories and vote on them. Go right out there right now. Dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Last Friday, we talked about Bloomberg's report that OpenAI executives met with content studios, media executives, talent agencies. Sam Altman got to go to some Oscar parties. Uh, and supposedly, they were discussing ways studios could use OpenAI's tools. Makes perfect sense. Since then, select artists have apparently been given early access to OpenAI's text-to-video tool called Sora. And OpenAI has been showing some examples of their work on its blog. Uh, there's a video called Airhead, which tells the story of a person with a balloon for a head. And of course, the balloon is AI generated, we assume. The Golden Record is a fanciful journey into the creation of the Golden Record that NASA affixed to the Voyager probe, uh, you know, showing things that you can't show because there's no camera out there with Voyager. And Beyond Reality is a faux do documentary about hybrid wildlife. Uh, if you like some cryptozoology, you might want to check that one out. Andrew, the obvious thing to talk about with generative video is Hollywood and TV production, but I know you think there's a bigger use for the technology as something called world simulators. Uh, explain a little bit about what that well, means and how that differs from, from what we're talking about here. Yeah, I mean, the the purpose of Sora wasn't just to say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could do video too? The purpose of Sora, and if you get into, I highly advise people take a look at, there's the blog post and then there's the technical report, which goes a little bit deeper into when you want to build an AI, and remember OpenAI's goal is to build artificial general intelligence, like super intelligent systems, which means they need to understand how the world works. And you can learn a lot through text, but you need to learn through other things, mathematics and being able to run code. Here, the goal is, can you build a thing that's basically a physics simulator? Can you have a system that can all of a sudden understand if I drop a ball, what happens, et cetera? So that's really think about Sora as the way it's simulating the world to make predictions and try to understand and then learn from it. That also happens to be a really cool tool for making videos. But think of it really, how do you get to AGI? Just like you have a sense inside your head if you can predict and you can create models of how things will turn out, that's what Sora can do. So this is different than a large language model. I think that's that's important to understand, right? Yeah, the, the way to think about it is when you train a language model, 
what well, it is it is part of it. Like you can train them together. So when you train a language model, you take your words and you convert them into tokens. And you, you know, basically, the might be just you know like four numbers, right? You know, a, a bigger word, a word like merit, you know, might be two you know tokens grouped together. But you turn your words into ma mathematical numbers, just into numbers, right? And then you predict those sequence of numbers. When you want to build an image generator, you do the same thing. You take a photo. And you tokenize it, you break it down into tokens, and then you put that as, as a sequence and you say, okay, here's maybe the first half of the image, predict what the rest of the image looks like. Or here's a label that said, you know, dog sitting on birthday cake. What should those image tokens look like? So it's the same thing. And what they did with Sora is they take basically sequences of images and they break them down in each image into basically like these quadrants, they call them space time regions. And so the model tries to predict each quadrant tries to predict what another, or each section tries to predict what another section is going to do, and then what they're going to do over time. And that was kind of the big breakthrough here. Rather than trying to predict frame to frame, each little section of that image of each still is trying to predict some other part and then going across time. And you know, the example we're looking at here is great because it shows you when you increase the amount of compute and how much more accurate it gets in ability to predict that. Right, because if you're listening to audio, it's it, off of the blog. Uh, they show like, you know, it used to be the dog would sort of grow three heads while it was doing video. Yeah. And then <laughs> over time, it got to look more like a dog uh, running around, right? Um, it, there, but a, it's still doing it's the a, similar thing to, to the LLM in that it is predicting yeah. what the next piece of data and should it, be. And it is trained. Like literally, it is trained. You just give image tokens or video tokens and you sort you put them in. So these like Chat GPT with vision, which is the version that understands photos, is a LLM that's also said, hey, these are now image tokens, predict what these do. And so it is, mm -hmm. these are they're called multimodal models because you can just give them whatever kinds of tokens you want and you explain what they are. It's pretty fascinating to think that that can then turn into predicting physics because it's not yeah. designed to predict physics. It's just something yeah. you can make it do. But you you can do that with a language model. Though. If a language model, if I give it enough examples and I say, what happens if I drop an egg? It'll say it falls. You know, yeah, it will the learn floor. these yeah, things yeah. over time. Yeah, it, yeah you yeah. know, it's, and our understanding of physics, remember, is an abstract representation. You know, we're just, we have a story or a narrative that allows us to make predictions about something. And that's the same thing LLMs are doing. So what do you think a world simulator can do that we're not thinking about when we think it because most people think oh it's going to create a movie like what else should we be thinking about i i have an article coming out and one of the examples i use in, in, in a little bit lengthy but i apologize but it's worth it i promise you if we showed the camera the first photograph was taken of people of like 1838 you know two people were one guy's getting his shoes shined a camera happened to capture it you had to leave the exposure open for so long but they managed to get people on a photo those de Gure, and if you talk to somebody at that time, like, hey, you've talked to an artist, you say, hey, look, I took this photo of people. They might start to panic. Well, first they'd be like, ah, they're blurs, who cares? Well, a year later, look, they're very clear. They might be panicking, going, well, what's going to happen to an artist? You know, in 1838, looking at a camera, you might be terrified, but try to explain motion pictures to that person. Try to explain the film industry. Imagine trying to explain in 1838 somebody like James Cameron who had a budget bigger than the entire United States defense budget in 1838 in non-adjusted dollars, making a movie with a crew of people <laughs> bigger than half the size of the United States standing army with a box office return that was greater than the entire GNP of the US <laughs> United States in 1838. That is, again, unadjusted dollars. But the point is, that's insane. And that would be, you would be like, you sound like a lunatic. Why will our future be any different? In fact, we're accelerating. Things are moving faster. So that's hard for us to understand. And I, I try to avoid normally like just getting into the realm of what it will be like in 20 years. And I think, you know, I like Tom, like a lot of people here, like, you know, I've read books on futurism and all this sort of stuff. And the one thing I've learned is we're really bad. I mean, the best estimates I find are often going much, much further back when people weren't biased by our sense of the present today. So mm -hmm. what it'll be like, I don't know. But look at that 1838 example. Yeah. So, so in other words, there, we won't know until we get this tool and start playing around with it, what we could do that we never thought we could do before. Think, think about Pong, somebody playing Pong and explaining Grand Theft Auto, you know, Cyberpunk. Yeah, yeah. Try to explaining mm -hmm. to that person, that would sound just surreal to them. And then somebody else would be like, well, the amount of compute you would need for that would be impossible. You wouldn't be able to do that. You're like, for a game, like, well, guess what, you know. I mean, uh, even our, even oh, the concept, ahead. the the uh, you know somewhat uh, somewhat basic concept of using tokens, because you know the prompts are really just pieces of math and predictions. That 
would have been really hard for somebody to, you know, wrap their head around. And this is like a tech person like myself, like five years ago, I'd be like, what? I mean, if you want something that's computer generated to do something that is fantastical, then you need, you know, some skilled artist to do that fantastical thing. It can't be done otherwise. Now we're getting into, you know, we're talking about like, well, it's really good at physics. Uh, and if you want the physics to work weirdly, then, you know, you have to do extra prompts. So it's this, it, it, it reminds me really of search. It's like, okay, well, that search result wasn't what I wanted. Okay, let me get more creative. And, you know, you iterate, you iterate, and then you finally get where you want to go. Well, Sarah, you know, one of the things we did, I was at OpenAI when we released Dolly. And the first thing we did is we went out to artists and gave them access. Now, at the time, I started opening, I was a prompt engineer and I would be the prompt whisperer internally when like, how do we get this thing to do the thing? And I felt really good about my prompting skills. And so when I played with Dali, I could do some cool stuff. Then we gave it to artists. Once they got it, just totally blew away anything I could do. And I realized, oh, wow. You know, when you put these tools in the hands of people who understand art, understand not, not just how to hold a paintbrush or what tool to use in Photoshop, but really understand what it means to create something they excel. And I, I find that people who are incredibly talented artists thrive when you give them new tools. People who are more mediocre tend to be frightened. And I think we're going to see this with Sora. We're going to see exceptionally talented people just blow us away using the same tools that you or I might have access to. Yeah, because they know the vocabulary better than we do because they work with it every day. So they 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 have run up against those limits uh, of what you can do with the current tools. And and I, I think they see a little farther uh, on, on yeah. where it could go. Yeah, I remember um, in art, art, this art class being amazed when a teacher said, you know, air is not invisible. And I never thought about that. And I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a great example of, of like the the sort of thing that you you don't think about if you if you haven't studied it. All right, before we get out of here, let's check out the mailbag. We got a good one from Lee who writes in, I was in Phoenix in February and made it a point to ride in a Waymo while I was there. Took two trips at night and the Waymo drove better than I would have. Yes, it was cautious, but not overly cautious. It, if it has time to pull out after a stop sign, it would, as long as the car in the lane in front was at a safe distance and safe speed. It slowed for every speed bump, handled a roundabout fine. Watching the monitor was comforting to see it picking up every car and pedestrian in the area. Like many big cities, Lee says, Phoenix has a homeless problem. The Waymo picked up people sitting 20 or so feet from the road that I hadn't noticed. I had a great experience on both of my rides. I think of driverless tech as a teenage driver who will learn from every mistake and teach every other teenager the learned lesson. After riding a Waymo, I look forward to having level four or five autonomy for the average consumer. Uh, Lee also says, I will be in Austin for Brian's eclipse party. Looking forward to meeting Tom and anybody else that might also be attending. Oh yeah! If you uh, if you haven't checked that out, uh, the the Founders Day Eclipse Party at at Brian Brushwood's place in Austin has happened on April eighth. I, I will look forward to to saying hi to you uh, when when we're there, Lee. Thanks for writing in. Uh, and, and you know what, Allison Sheridan also described her trip in a Waymo in Phoenix as a teenage driver. So I, I think that's pretty apt. Uh, what? And then Dan. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Wait, is it my first time in a Waymo? OpenAI had their Dev Day, their big their big one day developer conference and i was there with the group of developers i work with we went there we went to the after party and then we time to leave somebody called up a car and we all got inside of a waymo and we're driving away and we're like we just left an ai event inside of a waymo <laughs> and that was like and my brain yeah. was trying to process because the night before devo was performing across the street i'm like There's oh wow so much <laughs> intersection going yeah, on a here. lot of synchronicity there we had a devo uh, performance back in the tech tv days if i recall Mm -hmm. Christmas yeah, party. I think like a Christmas party. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Dan wrote in uh, on our Patreon actually and said the amazing Trisha Hirschberger makes an appearance and I am an avoider of games with micro payments as well. It feels that most of those games never let you become great at them with only a free version. You want to be the top dog in the game? You must pay. As a marketer though, I totally get the concept of micro payments and see why it's lucrative. You make an addicting fun game to play for free. You want them to excel at the game you provide an easy and very low hurdle to jump to make that conversion. Uh, thank you, Dan, as always, for uh, commenting over there on the Patreon. Yeah, thanks to everybody who uh, who writes in. Uh, Patreon messages, always appreciated, as our emails, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And Jermaine, you are also appreciated. Let folks know where they can keep up with you when you're not on our show. Um, easiest is I'm on 
Twitter, okay, X, at Andrew Main. Uh, also, andrewmain.com. I got a blog. I talk a lot about AI and stuff and try to explain it in sort of normal person terms. Um, I write books on Amazon. Type in Andrew Main. You'll see uh, one of my novels. My current one's Dark Dive, available now, which is a thriller in my underwater investigation unit series, which is basically about a police diver in South Florida who goes on some very interesting cases. Five books in that series. Is that right? That series, yeah, five books, yeah. Wow, uh, it, it, it's it's amazing the the prolificness that you have of of, of good stuff. As, as, oh, you're everybody. gonna talk, Tom. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> uh, go check it out, folks. Look up Andrew Main at a bookstore near you. Patrons, yeah, stick he- around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. Uh, reactions to new tech these days seems more negative than positive. Is tech guilty until proven innocent these days? We're gonna discuss. Just a reminder, we do the show live, and you can catch it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow with Scott Johnson, Parson Phil Spencer's take on the state of video games. The DTNS Family of Podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>